This is Mark Kramer, Senior Lecturer of Entrepreneurship at Bend University and host of Asian Founders and Funders. And today, our guest is Chris Nicot, Founder CEO of No More Learning. And Chris has moved here from the United States and has made his home here in Vietnam. And he is starting a new company. So Chris, uh, first of all, welcome. And uh, please tell us a little bit about yourself and then tell us about your company. Great, yes, thank you, uh, Mark. And uh, hello to uh, both uh, your podcast listeners in the future and then the, um, you know, all the uh, entrepreneurs uh, of the future uh, in your class. Um, yeah, so my name's Chris Pico. Um, I'm the CEO and founder of No More Learning Incorporated. Um, yes, as Mark uh, mentioned, uh, three months ago, I moved from the San Francisco Bay Area in California in the United States uh, to Hanoi, Vietnam, in order to launch uh, this um, kind of technical venture. Um, a little background uh, um, to start off in. Um, so I um, grew up uh, in the Chicagoland area, attended uh, a public high school um, that's in the middle uh, of the United States. Um, I went to California for the first time as an undergraduate uh, studying at Stanford University, uh, where I studied comparative literature. Um, I attended school there at the height of the uh, kind of pre-dot-com bust um, in the late uh, 90s, early 2000s. And um, even though I was always very computer oriented myself, um, I decided to study literature because I found history, philosophy, art more challenging and fascinating than just the, uh, the technical aspects of computers. But all along, I was always thinking at the borderline between um, kind of books and technology. And that's just been uh, kind of a passion uh, uh, and a theme throughout my life that finally took form um, in this company. And so uh, I'll, I'll leap over uh, a varied career um, very quickly. Um, I, I taught high school uh, for a couple of years in Philadelphia. Um, uh, and uh, I worked in the publishing industry uh, right out of college. Um, I uh, re uh, went to graduate school uh, at University of Chicago and studied public policy and then had a career working in state and local government in the United States in a technical capacity. Um, and then my most recent role was with Activision, uh, the uh, video game company where I was working uh, in analytics on Call of Duty. Um, and so essentially, um, uh, I saw an opportunity to transition from that work in the video game industry and then, uh, you know, launch in the dynamic uh, Vietnamese economy, um, uh, this new venture uh, of learning and technology uh, that I call uh, No More Learning. Um, so that's kind of the general overview. Uh, I, I could focus a little bit more on kind of the, the idea behind it, uh, unless you uh, have other questions to pivot to. Chris, that is my next question. Um, tell us a little bit about how you came up with it. I'm sorry, could you, could you repeat that? That was a little hard to hear. Sure. So what I asked was, tell us about your business and how did you come up with this idea? Okay. Um, yeah, so... Um, so the idea has been um, kind of with me ever since I was a, a, a young man. Um, so actually, uh, uh, I studied ancient Greek uh, when I was in high school. And uh, one kind of challenge with um, languages is how you memorize things. Um, so um, basically, I started working on technical ways of um, dealing with random samples from texts um, uh, very early on. Um, and uh, over the years, I've built uh, several iterations. This is over a period of 10 to 15 years. I, I've built several iterations on a kind of a basic new method of, um, of reading um, that, uh, you know, currently exists in a, um, a web hosted uh, form at nomorelearning.com. And so um, 
basically, uh, you know, my entrepreneurial route uh, is the one that takes what I'm truly passionate about just as a person, uh, kind of creating a product that I love and enjoy and it benefits me um, so that, uh, you know, during the development process, every every aspect of the work that I do um, is something I I, um, I benefit from. Um, uh, it, um, uh, it, it doesn't have a kind of a tiresome aspect to it. Um, and then, um, you know, I've been kind of triangulating that idea toward um, kind of just looking at how technology works, how people use the internet as a way of um, kind of coming up with uh, new ways of interacting with knowledge. Um, so the company form aspect of it is, rel is relatively recent. Um, you know, just to throw out one kind of technical aspect, you know, I only incorporated um, in California uh, within the last year. You know, so that, that formal business step of establishing yourself as a you know, corporation, that then you have shares. Uh, I only did this recently. And, you know, it's part of my, um, you know, entree into like a business entrepreneur role, which I haven't had previously. So this is actually relatively new to me, even though kind of technical, um, you know, product creation is just part of my um, general interest. Trying to turn this into kind of a viable company is something that only happened recently. And then leaving, you know, full-time work in order to work full-time uh, on this venture uh, as I said, only happened even more recently than that uh, within the last six months. And so what kind of research did you do before you decided to launch this business? Uh, that That's a good uh, question. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I've followed closely um, the whole startup uh, world for a long time. I guess one way to give an index of that is you know, Hacker News. You know, if people are familiar with, you know, so Y Combinator, which is one of the largest uh, kind of most uh, successful uh, startup accelerators, um, they have this news site called Hacker News and a lot of kind of tech plugged in people, um, you know, work there, report on their progress, launch their products there. Um, so, you know, I've been reading that uh, in detail uh, throughout my career, you know, on and off for 10 years. You learn a lot of, uh, you know, success and failure stories there. Um, and, you know, so basically, you know, a model, partly as I was alluding to, of picking something si since, since um, you know, the wisdom goes, uh, starting a, uh, engaging on a startup is not um, a short term um, uh, kind of goal. Uh, essentially, if you if you want to um, kind of succeed in the long term, you're looking at you know, three, five, 10 years of commitment, um, you know, something along those lines. Um, so I knew what I was getting to into in that respect. Um, and um, I guess the, the catalyst uh, most recently actually was the, the kind of the launch of AI. Um, I followed that very closely um, uh, when it's happened. And uh, in my view, uh, you know, artificial intelligence uh, will fundamentally transform uh, much of work generally, uh, particularly what were uh, known more as white collar roles. Um, and so, you know, a professional uh, like like I was uh, kind of in my technical career um, will transform. And so uh, essentially the, the startup venture for me is trying to create kind of a personally created kind of business um, vehicle uh, that allows me to do what I think is most important um, and then, you know, make a, a career out of it. So one of the questions that students have asked is, what factors made you choose Vietnam uh, market as a strategic move? Yeah, great question. Um, so I had been uh, studying Vietnam. Uh, the best I could for, for a number of years. Um, uh, I learned, I studied uh, political science at University of Chicago and uh, U.S. foreign policy. Um, and uh, the Vietnam War uh, is a complicated um, and uh, tragic um, kind of uh, era uh, in uh, the U.S. So um, I, I learned about Vietnam first there 
Um, it was actually um, the lectures of a, um, uh, a professor. His name's a Stephen Young. Um, he uh, grew up uh, as his, his father was an ambassador to Thailand. So he grew up in Vietnam speaking Vietnamese. And he was the first time I heard lectures on uh, ancient Vietnamese history, which is not well uh, documented in English. Um, so learning about um, kind of Vietnam over the past 200 years, um, and then the, the longer term really piqued my interest. Um, uh, and so basically having kind of a, a yet um, um, kind of less explored scholarly um, country uh, combined with uh, Vietnam being one of the fastest growing countries in the world with this kind of accelerated launch um, starting in the 1990s. Um, that, that's kind of what initially piqued my interest. Um, so I visited for the first time um, about six months ago um, and during that visit, I met uh, a professor at the Hanoi University of Science and Technology, a professor of architecture, um, who is also involved in the Vietnamese government's efforts towards digital transformation. Um, so he, he's a bit of a cultural historian. And while, during that brief visit, which was only uh, three weeks, I put together a pilot project that really showed me uh, uh, what's possible here. And if I could take a couple of minutes to describe it, I think it might uh, help also situate kind of what the core idea of my company is. Um, so uh, if uh, your, your, your students uh, and some of the listeners from Vietnam or who have visited Hanoi, uh, maybe uh, will certainly be familiar with the Van Mio, uh, the Temple of Literature, uh, which is a approximately thousand year old, um, maybe 800 year old uh, Confucian court of learning uh, that's in cent the center of Hanoi. And um, essentially uh, it's a beautiful place. And uh, one of the, the signature um, uh, exhibits there or relics um, are these stele, these large 82 very large stone tablets that record uh, in writing the graduates of the Confucian examinations over a period of four to 500 years. So I learned from this professor when I was here, uh, he said, you know, students go on a pilgrimage essentially of all ages to the temple of literature in order to pray for success uh, in their exams. But he um, mourned that most of the students go there and then they pat on the head the turtles that have the stele on top of them, the kind of the sacred animal, one of the sacred animals of Vietnam, a turtle, um, the back, uh, the, these, these stone tablets are on the back of turtles. They pat them on the head, but they don't read the tablets. So he's saying that's so unfortunate, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, part of his work and a, a large part of the kind of the government recovery efforts is kind of cultural restoration. So what I was able to do uh, during that first trip six months ago was to locate the texts of those 82 stele written in Han Nong, the old form of Vietnamese writing that, that uses Chinese ideographs. So I located those 82 uh, texts and I put them into a vector database, uh, which is a, a database that's used in AI so you can query texts. So I, I put the 82 stele into a vector database and then set up a portal where you can ask questions to the tablets. Um, and it worked astonishingly well. Uh, I, was, I was very glad to see it work where um, I, I created a pilot where you in Vietnamese could ask, for instance, how do we improve Vietnam? And then it queries this database of the text of the tablets and then responds using the voice of the tablets uh, to answer your question in the way that uh, we've come to use uh, AI methods. So anyway, this was, this was uh, kind of well received both by him and other uh, partners. And then I, I put together several proposals to kind of expand upon that type of work. 
And so basically this was uh, kind of a, a dream come true for me um, to be able to kind of expand in uh, a technical area I wanted to work in AI and digital techs and then find kind of a cultural item that is available but inaccessible and then use AI to kind of get at it. And so that basically established uh, kind of a collaboration with a local person, uh, a professor of architecture, a former party member, um, and then also uh, a, a head um, kind of associated with this group called Nusa Tech, which is a uh, kind of a, a, v, um, a Hanoi based startup, startup incubator of sorts that's very new and trying to do innovative things. So basically that showed me I have kind of working partners there. This is the type of work I want to do. And then just took the opportunity to make uh, a departure from my uh, nine to five in order to come to Vietnam. Well, the way I'm kind of bored. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, great. I'm kind of blown away that you say you developed an AI where I could ask old, um, old tablets and content, and it will take that information and formulate answers. So I could take the five books of Moses, the Torah, and ask it questions. And it will tell me the answers based on what people wrote 5,000 years ago. Correct. Correct. Yes. Wow. Yeah. And, wow. and yeah, it's the, the, this, that angle on how to use these large language models, these AIs that essentially animate language. Um, th this is uh, the product market fit that I'm looking for because it's, it's unprecedented. Um, you know, it's any of these from Confucian and you could go and make them instant best up by just the fact that people could go and ask questions and actually draw out useful information that could guide their lives, make uh, decisions, right? True. Although, I, um, uh, the 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 um the space of the technical and user interface problem has uh many gnarly challenges um um one of which just to kind of uh play kind of the other side of your optimistic view uh which i i i uh, affirm uh, entirely um the past uh, is very complicated. And hearing a direct voice from the past when you ask it, you know, contemporary questions doesn't give automatically uh, practical or easy answers. And so one, one of the biggest challenges uh, uh, I see as I'm still thinking this through is, um, you know, the love of learning and the acquaintance with history, um, yes, in an idealistic way, should be um, a great product with a giant market, but uh, it's not so easily commoditizable. Um, you know, there is an education industry, uh, but, you know, true learning um, is not so obviously able to be fit into the uh, buying and selling or the, the transactional nature of how we interact with computers. So this is part of what I think is the, the promise of trying to rethink how we relate through computers um, with the kind of the ancient world. Uh, but yeah, so I think there, there's a lot of promise um, and many different permutations. Um, and uh, because of this, uh, one thing I, I could talk about, uh, which um, may and now to come up, but um, you know, part of this venture, even though you know, like a startup, you know, you build a company entity, you try to ge generate revenue, um, you know, kind of you're building with uh, an existing idea, but there's another uh, kind of strand of uh, entrepreneurship which goes by indie hacking, you know, independent hacking, where you're more uh, kind of spawning many different ideas um, all at the same time. Uh, so this is 
what I'm doing on the side. Uh, because one of the great powers of these new AIs is that they can do the coding for you. A lot of that. I mean, this is this is an unprecedented um, reality that's come uh, online in the past three months. So, you know, while I'm investigating digital text, I've, I've spun up a way to um, scrape Vietnamese news sites, hundreds of them, and then mass translate them from Vietnamese into English. Um, I've kind of created vocabulary learning tools, um, a type of kind of radio of uh, kind of automatic question and answers with texts. Um, and, you know, because uh, again, with the product market fit, I, I think the um, getting the interface right so that it's uh, kind of genuine and um, inviting for people to, for instance, engage with, um, you know, historical texts, um, yeah, there, there's there's a lot a, a lot to explore, but uh, I I do agree there's great promise and, uh, and and I'll just say as as a final note on that part of the reason of coming to Vietnam is I figured if I could create the product using Vietnamese language, a language I do not speak other than a few hundred hours of Vietnamese language since I was here, if I if I could make it work in a language I don't speak then I know that I could do it in any language because this is another aspect of these uh, technologies. They work in essentially uh, almost all of the commonly spoken languages in the world. And it's really, uh, once you make it with one, you can do it with any of them. So did you write up, did you write up a business plan before you started this? Did you put uh, fingers to typewriter and uh, your laptop. Uh, um, so I did a survey of my own resources. Uh, this entire venture is bootstrapped uh, with my own resources. I, I do not have any funding uh, currently. Um, I explored that, um, but decided not to uh, even seek it at this time. Um, uh, so essentially, you know, the business plan was one of me just taking stock of what I have available, how much runway that would possibly give me, um, different kind of off ramps in the indie hacker or future career options that might uh, show up. And then uh, just recognizing that, you know, I have enough runway to give this uh, a real earnest shot. And then, um, you know, kind of had a, a, yeah, a long enough time to um to uh focus on it exclusively so in that respect um i didn't have to yet um kind of uh project revenue or or anything and and currently i am i am free revenue i don't have any revenue from this um even though i have set up the infrastructure uh, in order to receive payment um but uh yeah i'm not kind of i guess in that way i'm pre-launch uh uh, but yeah, so essentially the yeah the business proposal or business planning was uh, kind of I was able to do it in a very minimal way since uh, at this time I don't have uh, kind of full time employees um, I'm just operating independently um, I have in the past uh, uh, kind of uh, hired uh, web developers um, in order to to make aspects of that so that's a cost that I've uh, factored in. Um, another aspect of coming to Vietnam is assessing, uh, you know, how much staff uh, is required to get to that uh, kind of product market fit and then the proposal uh, kind of pitch uh, stage. But uh, no, essentially it, it was it was pretty, uh, pretty um, basic um, in that respect. Uh, and that but that was all I needed. Uh, the students want to know, how are you going to make money? Yeah, right. Uh, good question. Um, well, so I mean, so currently the website actually is set up. Um, so if you go to nomorelearning.com, you know, you're presented with a random sentence from about 800 books. Um, there are there's an ability to log in and there's an ability to subscribe. Uh, if you subscribe for $10 a month, uh, you get access to thousands of books. 
Um, you know, so that that was you know what I put out there just to kind of get the in pavement infrastructure up there. Um, you know, so that that's one feasible way to get funding. Um, another way, which um, I've explored since coming to Vietnam, uh, is kind of digital uh, management consultancy. Right, put it that way, kind of independent management consultancy. In, in my uh, career uh, in technology, um, I did kind of digital organizational transformation. And basically kind of helping plan transformation of databases, system operations um, at a large scale uh, for state, local government, and then uh, with Activision. So um, I've noted, uh, you know, it made, part of the digital transformation mandate uh, of the Vietnamese uh, government, rec the, you know, the, there's a nationwide goal to get to you know a digital economy within the next 10 to 15 years and then kind of leapfrog into a middle income country in the same time so there's there's a recognition first of all vietnam wants to accelerate and leapfrog uh in, into into technology and organizations all organizations from financial firms to the refrigeration association Every single one of them wants to digitally transform. They're figuring out how to do it. So uh, part of what I've recognized in coming here and just talking to people is people are looking for people who have former expertise in doing that. So I've, I've met with various, several stakeholders uh, in different industries, uh, the financial industry, the government industry, um, uh, you know, government services. Uh, and I've put together proposals of kind of offering uh, guidance in how to use AI processes to improve organizational efficiency. Um, th these proposals have not yet turned into signed contracts, uh, but I have seen that there is a market. And so essentially if uh, you know, my monthly active users you know, doesn't uh, get to a point where it covers my monthly expenses, uh, such that uh, I could extend my runway here uh, forever into the future, then part of the kind of fallback plans or kind of side work uh, to do are, are these uh, kind of consulting uh, services, which is great actually for me personally, because, um, you know, even though operating independently as an entrepreneur is very exciting because you kind of get to do everything, it's also very difficult, uh, bordering on impossible. Um, <laughs> this is what they say, and uh, I can kind of speak with some experience. Um, and so, but at, at the same time, working with existing large organizations is very uh, exciting, important, and then, uh, you know, can pay. Uh, so essentially, uh, you know, the company, even though I have this kind of web service of this learning process, uh, it's also serving a dual role as a kind of uh, a management consultancy uh, and technical consulting. Um, and so that's kind of essentially another revenue source that I'm pursuing. I'm Chris, um, we're teaching agile innovation here. And part of it is, you know, how do you come up with your ideas? So where do your ideas come from? Uh, the students want to know, and is there a tip on coming up with new ideas? Uh, yeah, great. So, um, so one way I come up with ideas is things I need. Um, for instance, with the tablets, the Stele at the Van Mio, um, I myself couldn't read them. Uh, or talk to them. So uh, if I built a way to read and talk to them, great, I can do that too. And I've done so extensively, uh, which at least shows me that uh, that is a product that should have a market. Um, so it, um, in general, um, talking to people, you know, as I told that story, it was talking to the professor about the temple of literature and the tablets that made me learn that the texts exist. There is a recognized need 
in Vietnam for thinking about ways to bring history and preserve history. Um, and then essentially I kind of just took those needs and then scrambled to see if I could figure out a way to create a pilot uh, solution around that. Um, and uh, that one happened to kind of dovetail very well with kind of existing technology and my, and my needs. So that one came naturally. Um, in general, I don't think it's so much more complicated than that. Like what's something that you need or something that someone else might need and then, um, yeah, see if you uh, can put together something uh, for that. Um, you know, there, there's different uh, kind of strategies about entrepreneurship. A lot of it revolves around how much pressure you have to, to make revenue. Um, you know, mo most startups, I think, do uh, focus on that kind of revenue basis, uh, you know, because if you can't get paying customers, uh, maybe you're not uh, hitting a need. Um, so, um, you know, learning as much of, about the economy as possible um, is is beneficial, you know, because that would be another way of, uh, of looking, even if you're not talking to someone specifically, if you just pick an industry and just do a informal research survey of what are the existing companies out there? What do they do? Um, you know, are there any unmet needs? Um, and again, this, this is an area where just strategic, consistent application of AI does wonders. I mean, it's really startling how well they work. You know, what types of startups might form revenue producing companies within the next six months in Hanoi? You know, you can ask that to any number of existing uh, large language models, and they'll give you a pretty good idea of where to start. Um, and and I think the the key to making it more realistic is then bringing empirical data to those general sketches. And and to me, that's the so like you need to get kind of cutting edge reality data in order to feed it into these thinking machines. Um, and then basically, uh, you know, pick one, uh, follow it through. Um, yeah, and don't, uh, don't get caught up in uh, ideas that won't work. Um, you know, I guess this is from the revenue side, but if, if you pick things that should be done and are intrinsically worth doing and you like doing them, then it's then it's easy because essentially there's no way to fail. Um, you know, maybe if you don't succeed revenue, but then at least you've built something that's valuable. Uh, you've yourself learned from it, um, and then you know uh, you can just go from there. Oh, who has the question? Oh, thank you, Mike. Would you like to ask her? Yes, I think I have a question. So actually, I am thinking about. So, so I find it fast. I don't know. Okay. Um, yeah, but actually, there's a problem about cost. So, somehow, when I think about my idea, so it is somehow, do you think that the ideas can be much more complex and different in different countries? Like, somehow, like Vietnamese healthcare system. So, basically, my idea is related to healthcare. So, I feel like that Vietnam is a very, it's a country with a health that most people use the government health service. So in US, I find the type feel one that people that actually goes to the hospital, the government hospital much, they often use the personal service. So somehow my idea is that yeah, so when you start up, you need to find ideal model that you can place on the service and you can you know identify and think about the potential strengths of your idea, right? But when I started to think about it, there was some kind of problem because my ideal model is in the US. But the US healthcare system is kind of different because the government system is they don't use much, they use the personal healthcare. But in Vietnam, the government health service people most use. Uh, don't look the question if you have Yeah. So my question is why? Do you think that uh sometimes the idea can be much more you know different when you compare it? 
in, in other countries. I, I mean, yep. that, that's yeah, so, it's a great what is uh, the ideal model. Do you have any ideal model when you think about your idea? And is there any you know differences between the ideal model in different countries when you think about the idea? So, sure. first, basically, is your model going to be different in Vietnam than it would be in the United States? Yeah, uh, yeah, a great uh, question about a very important, uh, vital industry and, um, you know, really hits on both the challenges in working in between countries, but then the promise. Um, so, yes, there are certainly differences. Maybe maybe you say it in it. Uh, on the other side, part of our moment in history now is that we all use the same technology, um, even though there are big differences. Um, one aspect of Vietnam that's worth looking very carefully at is how it differs from China's uh, technology ecosystem. Uh, Vietnam has more of an open model uh, in uh, some key respects than China. Um, so I think there's market opportunities in a, kind of a U.S. European style here in Vietnam, because that's how the technological ecosystem um, is being kind of uh, fostered. Um, so. You know, I mean, you you picked uh, a notoriously difficult uh, kind of area, health healthcare, um, which um, I mean, the, the U.S. probably isn't the model uh, you want to work in because the U.S. has notoriously terrible healthcare uh, that's very inefficient, um, extremely expensive, and has very low satisfaction. Um, nonetheless, that does create uh, many healthcare startups uh, and there are some very ambitious uh, startups happening. I mean, I think if you are, uh, I think a first order attempt would be um, trying to create a Vietnamese variant of a successful US startup, um, you know, copying ideas, you know, kind of does get a kind of a bad sense in certain respect, but there's a there's something to uh, the advantage of the second comer. Um, it's far easier to create a viable entity once someone else takes the risk and time to prove that it can be done. Uh, so that's kind of more revenue viable. Um, but um, to me, what's kind of more difficult but more interesting interesting um, is trying to see kind of new configurations somewhere in between country models. Um, so, you know, in that respect, uh, you know, looking at the United States, looking at China, um, and then looking at the existing kind of Vietnamese, both private and public sector, uh, and, you know, kind of Thinking hard about models there uh, is worth doing. I, I, I hope there's some general observations. One thing I'll also just say, just about working uh, adjacent to the government, it's very difficult um, and it's slow, um, but it's very important. So uh, many of the most vital sectors of our lives are uh, run by government agencies or strongly structured by government agencies, um, but they are the least uh, accessible to entrepreneurial change. Um, so um, you want to keep that in mind. Uh, you know, working with governmental partners have their own timelines that don't innovate uh, on their own. So you have to kind of take that into account, um, uh, but it is important. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I, but I do think kind of looking in between countries and what does or does not fit uh, is a great way to find uh, new ideas or kind of cross pollinate ideas between countries. Okay, um, we have a question here.
uh, one question of mine is that we learned from our course and it is important to pitch our proposal to experts within our specified domain and evaluate their integrations of our idea. So did you perform this when constructing your proposals of normal learning? Like did you pitch your ideas to any experts in the field to gain their comments and feedbacks? And if yes, how did their comments and feedbacks affect your idea? Um, yes, yeah, so I do think that is a good approach. Find um, kind of expertise in the industry or area. Um, in my case, uh, no. Uh, the idea is um, untried, um, and it definitely falls into a category of almost uh, incomprehensible because it's uh, so different. Um, and so uh, actually to the extent that I have shared this, and, and I have, um, you know, I, I studied uh, comparative literature um, uh, and, uh, you know, worked with some um, kind of well-respected literature scholars um, and innovators within digital humanities um, uh, at Stanford and University of Chicago. So sharing uh, ideas with scholars and then seeing what they don't understand or what uh, is a step beyond their kind of discipline uh, gave me uh, an indication that the idea uh, actually uh, is more viable uh, on, on a wider scale. So, I mean, in, in this case, uh, uh, kind of talking to experts serve a, a type of um, kind of a, an, an inverse con confirmation uh, to me. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, it, 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 for that particular idea, um, yeah, I, I, I essentially, because I was using my own strengths, having studied literature, it being a, a personal uh, joy. Uh, uh, that was kind of all the, the proof I need to know that it's, that it's viable. Uh, but I also do, you know, share it, um, and learn. So I do think, uh, in general, that is a good strategy. Uh, but, um, one should, uh, recognize when you are going into the unknown and the untried and have the courage to, try into that space. Um, you know, so it's complicated because basically you're doing something that's hard to understand and then bringing it to people and you may not, uh, you know, uh, find reception or revenue immediately. This is what makes uh, being an entrepreneur so difficult. Uh, but uh, if you can kind of just recover uh, and then uh, sort out, you know, what worked, what didn't, um, and then pursue the next thing uh, as long as you can. Essentially, it's it's a type of a marathon. Um, so yes, uh, of course, speak, speak to whatever experts you can, uh, learn as much as you can, uh, and uh, stick with it as long as you can. And, you know, essentially, uh, what is it? Yeah, um, uh, yeah, preparation brings luck. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I think benefiting from other people's preparation uh, is also very helpful. Okay, we have a question over here. We have a few questions, three questions. Um, um, so my question for you is that, what is your most valuable lesson as an entrepreneur when you run no more learning, like from the scratch and uh, all the way in progress that you run no more learning? Um, lesson, huh? It's, uh, uh, so, I mean, lo love of learning guided me to find, discover, kind of happen upon this method. And, uh, apart from entrepreneurship and apart from, um, education even uh the endurance importance and unfathomable extent of learning available to anyone 
uh, has been proven to me more and more. Um, I mean, this isn't so much a lesson, but this actually gets to kind of the, the um, a bit uh, paradoxical name uh, to the company, No More Learning. Um, you know, you asked for a lesson. Uh, part of what I find is uh, kind of at stake here is uh, many people conceive of education as an existing uh, set of uh, knowledge that you are absorbing and absorbing it kind of accurately or not. But there is a whole open uh, form of knowledge where you're, you're just learning without a guide. Um, and this type of learning um, is, uh, you know, uh, I think the, the best tradition of, ed of education uh, before it was institutionalized. Um, and so, um, you know, being an entrepreneur is uh, learning through business processes in the world uh, at large. Um, you know, so that 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 um, challenge uh, and difficulty uh, is um, worth doing, um, and. Uh, yeah, so uh, pardon the uh, the uh, the wide answer, um, but yeah, I'll just I'll just say um, maybe it made a more practical sense. Like being an entrepreneur, registering a company, defining your idea, and going around and saying I'm trying to do this, and then keeping an an open mind to move and change. It is an entirely different way of living than having a fixed job with a set role of tasks where someone else is telling you what to do. Um, you know, they're not entirely different and you can have kind of autonomy uh, at jobs in different roles, but it's a whole different uh, kind of way. And uh, yeah, I, it, but it's difficult. So I, I guess the main lesson would be it's difficult, but worth doing. And so if you, have to struggle or plan to give it your best shot. Uh, do so carefully, but do so. Okay, next question. Uh, so I want to ask a bit uh, uh, regarding your expertise. Uh, how do you approach AI integration into traditional work environments? Like what aspects are uh, AI most beneficial in, what to keep, what to change? Okay, interesting. Um, yeah, well, so the, I mean, what's unprecedented with AI, as I had mentioned, is that um, these computers can now do the type of planning tasks that were formerly considered the kind of the more difficult professional managerial tasks. So, what will have to be worked out across the entire world in every organization is how do the hierarchies of organizations function when the machine can do the role of the manager uh, uh, tasks. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, so, um, you know, it, it's this is why it's going. It's going to take a long time uh, to um, kind of work out different methods. But this is why I think the entrepreneurial uh, model is a good one because essentially the entrepreneur or the the CEO of a startup, you know, to put it that way, you know, is making the fundamental decisions of how you, you know, become viable with whatever resources are available, um, and so. You know, in general, and I think this is a uh, an important principle, is um, you know figuring out ways to assist those who kind of know less or are less uh, experienced, and to be most helpful uh, if you have kind of more influence. I think that's that's the 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 challenge, and and part of the. I think the challenge of working with existing organizations is now the machines 
and uh, the lower level employees within organizations will have better expertise about what the organization as a whole should do than the formal um, leadership of organizations. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a, um, a, a, a type of question that comes up more in political theory and the, uh, the history of human organizations as a whole. Uh, but I think that's what we'll be facing. So, um, you know, um, yeah, it will, it will, uh, it remains to be seen. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, there, there, there's, there's a lot to experiment with right now. One more question. Um, I have one question regarding AI. Um, I know that AI should be trained from a pool of data input. And how do you choose the reliable data for your normal learning? And if there is a bigger project like ChatGPT or OpenAI, um, how can people filter the data input for the AI to? So could you speak more about the specific, you're saying, so you said filter, or could you say or repeat what you first said about what's the concern? Technology, um, like um, charging with the use information on the internet and uh, ah, okay. the reliable resources for that. Okay. That's right. We hear that what people throw up on chat is incorrect. And so how do you right. make sure you have the reliable uh, data? And we'll need you to keep the answer short because we have to wrap up. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, great question. This is uh, an existing uh, challenge with you know hallucinations and inaccuracies. The tradition I'm coming from uh, is called philology. Basically, like the love and study of words. And so there's this, so this whole history of how you uh, tell what the actual meaning of a text is. There's many, many hundreds of years of tradition in the West. Confucianism uh, is largely based on this method, pulling out the meaning of texts. So the application of those methods and figuring out ways to establish what are valid or invalid answers or what are better or worse answers um, in ways that don't necessarily rely on people's opinions. Uh, this is the challenge. This is an unsolved problem. Uh, and uh, that's exactly what I'm working on. And I'll just say as a final note, you know, AIs are good, as you recognize, in taking essentially the input you give it and then outputting something of a similar type. Uh, but um, that does have the pitfall of if you input things that are false and it can't tell the difference between good and bad, uh, then uh, you will not have uh, a good system. Chris, thank you so much for taking the time. This one's a two of the best. Sam from the University of Chicago. So there's a big green on the other side of this video here, and we wish you luck and we look forward to seeing how it all goes. And thank you so much. And Great questions by the audience here. So again, everyone have a wonderful weekend. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope I get to.